certainly is wonderful to be with you all today. And what a joy it is to have you all celebrate in the baptism of those three kids. Uh, I didn't get to say it earlier because it's hard to hear, but baptism is something to be done in community. It's something that is uh, just as much about the kids as it is about this church family that's coming alongside of those kids as they uh, publicly profess their faith in Jesus, saying that you guys will journey with them in their faith journey, to be there to pray for them and to support them and to encourage them along the ways. And so that's why we do it in community. We don't just take a kid alone and baptize them, but we bring the whole community into it. So thank you for being here and for being a part of those three children's lives. It's very meaningful to them to be able to uh, proclaim that publicly to all of you today. Well, today we are in our third week of Advent. As uh, you can see by the candles, we're lighting one each week as we move forward to Christmas Eve and Christmas to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And it's an anticipation of what is to come that we are building towards, building towards that celebration of Jesus' birth. And for us today as well, it's a building towards the hope of Christ coming again. It's living in the, the in-between of Christ having come and died and risen from the grave and knowing that he is to come again that we look forward to with great hope. And so today we're going to continue in this Advent season as we move closer to Christmas. But let's pray together first. Gracious God, thank you for the ability to be here today in your presence. Lord, what a gift it is to gather with other believers each and every week. Proclaim that you are Lord of our lives. Proclaim that you are the most important thing in the world. To sing praises to you, to open up your word and hear you speak. To have you guide our lives each and every week. So Lord, we thank you and we praise you. Lord, may you open up our ears and soften our hearts now as we hear your word. May it guide us to become more like you, to shine bright for you in our world today. So we pray this in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Well, I was reading a story this week of someone who grew up in the church, grew up in a Christian family, and yet as they entered into adulthood, they left their faith and they became an atheist. And you've probably heard the stats that these are common stories. They're not one-off stories of people leaving the faith. And it's often occurred. But as I read this man's story, he told about how he had prayed to God for help. You see, he had been at one of the most expensive colleges in the country. And his funds had run out after the first year. And so he prayed to God asking that God would supply his needs. That God would provide the finances that he needed to continue in this college. And he trusted and believed and hoped that God would provide. And this is what he said. He said, trusting him to provide, I put in zero effort to provide for myself, such as applying for scholarships or financial aid or seeking part-time work to supplement my tuition. I prayed vigorously for God to provide for the funds I needed and had total naive faith that he would. When the funds I needed failed to arrive, I found myself in a crisis down to the core of my being. My faith in God as I understood him was rocked. If my prayer made in complete faith failed to work, what else could I trust? Well, who could I trust when they had all assured me that God would deliver? And he goes on in this essay he wrote about becoming an atheist and encouraging others to walk away from the faith as well, to talk about how that was the beginning of his faith unraveling, of him leaving Christianity and leaving God behind. And while situations like that are hard and challenging, when things don't go how we expect or how we hoped, it's important to recognize that the path of Christ is not always one that we get to design and choose and dictate what it will look like. There's many times that we think we know best and we think that we have the best idea of what our path of life could look like or how God could best use us or what that would entail. And yet God's ways are not always our ways. But what's important is how we respond, even when things don't go how we hoped. How we respond, even when the trajectory that we thought our life would take us on, doesn't pan out the same way. When things don't amount to what we thought they would. When scholarships don't come. When funding for school doesn't come. When we don't get the jobs that we want, or even when we lose loved ones before we're ready. What do we do in those moments because the answer is not to abandon our faith. The answer is not to, uh, to give God um, a disservice and say that it's God's fault that we didn't get what we had hoped for. When we look at Scripture, that's not the path that God calls us on as believers. So today we're going to look at one couple 
that had not got what they had desired in their lives, and yet they continued to faithfully follow God with righteousness. And God never abandoned them, and yet their path of hardship eventually led to this couple getting great blessings. So if you would turn with me to Luke chapter 1, we're going to be spending our time today in Luke chapter 1 and jumping around a little bit. So Luke chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 5. It says, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the vision of Abba, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, According to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So right away, this passage would have told us many things as Luke writes to us. It would have let us know the context of where we are at, that they are under Roman rule with Herod as king, that this would have equaled oppression for the Jews, that they would have been under that Roman rule, and we're introduced right away to Zechariah, a priest. And we're told where he comes from, and we're also told about his wife, Elizabeth, who is also of a priestly lineage. And we're told that they are righteous and blameless in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Now, this doesn't mean that they never messed up or made mistakes, but when they did, they would have gone and offered the sacrifices that were proper to receive that forgiveness from the Lord, as was the law of the time. And during this time, there's a lot of corruption going on, a lot of politics being played by both the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so the righteousness of Zechariah and Elizabeth stood out in a sharp contrast, as Luke describes them as walking blamelessly in the Lord's commands. And we also know that they're barren, that they don't have any children, and that they were advanced in years. Right away when we read this, it reminds me of Abraham and Sarah about how they too did not have any kids and were advanced in years and yet had desired that and it had never come to fruition. Well, Zechariah is identified here in the text as a priest and we're told that it was time for his division of the priest to be up for their duty at the temple. Now, I've heard this story many times and I didn't fully understand what this meant for a priest. And as I read further this week, what I found out is that at this time, there would have been about 18,000 to 20,000 priests in Israel. And these priests would take turns going to the temple to do the duties. And like the text tells us, that lots were cast to determine who would go in. And the greatest ministry of a priest's career was to be able to go in and offer the incense. It was considered the greatest honor Most likely, it would only take place one time in a priest's life because there are so many priests. Thus, to know that this is Zechariah's turn, this would have been an incredibly special day. This would have been the pinnacle of his career as a priest, the fact that he gets to go in, that he has been chosen to go in and do this, to go in and to burn incense, we're told, at the end of verse 9. According to the law of Moses that we see in Exodus, incense was offered to God on the golden altar every morning and every evening. And by this time, there was an established ritual of what this would look like. The lots would be cast to determine who would do the various tasks in the temple. There was the task of cleansing the altar. There was the task of preparing the fire, of killing the sacrifice, of sprinkling the altar, and lastly, of the one who would come in and offer the incense. And that one was the most privileged duty. And this, like I said, would probably be a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And before dawn, hundreds of worshipers would gather at the temple. The morning sacrifice would begin when the incense priest would walk towards the temple through the outer courts. And he would strike a gong-like instrument, which would call the Levites to assemble, to prepare to gather in songs of worship. The two other priests who were chosen that morning would walk up to the temple on either side of the priest who was chosen to offer the incense. And all three would enter the holy place together. One priest would set the burning coals on the golden altar, and the other would arrange the incense, and then these two priests would leave the temple. They would leave the incense priest alone in the holy place. And in front of him was a golden altar of incense. It was 18 inches square and three feet high. 
And on that small table laid the burning coals with little wisps of smoke rising up ready for incense. And behind the golden altar was a huge thick curtain. Behind that curtain was the Holy of Holies, the most holy place where no man could enter except the high priest on the only, on, only on the day of atonement. And so as he faced the golden altar of incense, to his right would be the table of showbread, and to his left would be the golden lampstand, which provided the only light in the holy place. And that's where we find Zechariah. The two priests have left. They've exited. He is alone in there, ready to offer this incense to the Lord. So let's continue in Luke 1.10 and see what happens on this important day. It says in verse 10, The whole multitude of people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayers have been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So John is there in the temple, and as the two men, sorry, Zechariah is there in the temple, and as the two men exit the temple, everyone knew what was happening. Everyone knew it was time for that third priest to offer the incense. So those who gathered outside would have bowed or kneeled before the Lord, spreading their hand in silent prayer. And this was an important moment as the priest would pray in the holy place in God's presence for the nation of Israel. And this is the moment when we're told that the angel appears before him. And Zechariah has the normal response that we see throughout Scripture of fear when the angel appears before him. And yet the angel encourages him to not be afraid as we see in verse 13. The angel says, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayers have been heard. His prayers have been heard. And yet the prayers that Zechariah would have been offering that day would have been for the nation. They would have been for Israel. They probably were not for a child as he was advanced in years. And my guess is that they had probably already come to grips with the fact that they would not have a child. And the news of this child, though, would bring great joy and gladness to them. The text tells us that not only would it bring joy and gladness to them, but that many will rejoice at his birth. And not only are they to have a son, but the angel Gabriel even gives them the name that they are to call their son, that they are to call their son John. And he is described by the angel as one who will be great before the Lord. Gabriel continues to tell Zechariah that their son will be filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. And then he starts in verse 16 to describe the path that this boy will take as he grows. That he will help turn the many children of Israel back to the Lord. That John's work will help provide a pathway for the people of Israel to Jesus, the Messiah the one who they've waited for, the one who the prophets foretold would come and rescue Israel, that John's role is to help prepare a path for Jesus. That he will go in the spirit and the power of Elijah, the prophet from the Old Testament who God used in mighty ways. That he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. And all of this, all of what John is doing is preparing a way For the people of Israel to come to the Lord, to come to Jesus, who will shortly be here. The angel has declared what God is going to do through Gabriel. God has told Zechariah that he is going to do this, that he has heard his prayers, and that he will answer them. Let's see how Zechariah responds in verse 18. Verse 18 of chapter 1, Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, 
you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that this thing, these things take place, because you not, did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service had ended, he went to his home. And after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. So Zechariah, not only when he first sees the angel, finds himself fearful, but now that he's heard what the angel is there to declare, that he will have a son, he is doubting how this will be. He responds asking, how shall I know this? How could this happen that he as an old man, his wife as an old woman could conceive a child? And so he wants to know, how shall I know this is true? He wants a sign. He wants some sort of declaration, confirmation to know that the angel's word is true. And he anchors his disbelief in the reality of his situation, the reality of his age and his wife's age. Gabriel, though, in verse 19, anchors his promise in the reality of who he is and who he speaks for as a messenger for God. He says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. See, Zechariah is thinking about his reality, about their age, and these things of how it could be, and Gabriel knows who he represents. Gabriel knows that he speaks on behalf of God who can work the miraculous. A God who age has no meaning when it comes to his will. And so Gabriel anchors his promise in who God is as he brings this good news. And the ESV expiratory commentary states that the word for good news here indicates that Gabriel is not conveying merely private and individualistic good news for Zechariah, but the message of good news is for all of Israel. You see, this proclamation, this news of the son that they will bear is good news for all of Israel because God is going to use John to help prepare that path to Jesus for Israel. But because of his doubt that he expresses, Zechariah has some consequences. The angel tells him that he won't be able to speak until this has come to fulfillment. And those gathered outside know the normal rhythm of how this works when a priest offers prayers and offers the incense. And so they start to wonder, well, what's taken so long? They wonder why Zechariah has not come out to them yet. And when he comes out, they realize that he is mute, that he must have seen a vision. Now, this would have been blatantly obvious for those who are gathered there, not only because he starts trying to motion with his hands to let them know what's occurred, but because there were priestly duties that Zechariah was supposed to do as he came out of the temple. Being the one who stayed in the temple and prayed for the nation as he was in there, upon exiting, he was supposed to stand on the temple steps, overlooking the crowd and pronounce a priestly blessing upon the people. And the other priest would repeat it after him. And we see that laid out in Numbers chapter 6, but as Zechariah comes out, he can't do that. He can't proclaim a priestly blessing upon the people because he's mute, because he doubted the word of the Lord when it was first given to him. And yet, what we see in the next verse is that Zechariah is still faithful. He's had this amazing experience with the Lord. He's been told this prophecy of what will come, of the gift of a son. He's been told the consequences for his doubt that he won't be able to speak, and he knows that he's mute now. And yet, he continues to fulfill his duties as a priest to finish out the remainder of his service before going home to his wife. Well, the section concludes in verses 23 through 25 by letting us know that Zechariah does go home to his wife Elizabeth and that she conceives a child. The beginning of seeing God's promise come to fruition because God is faithful to his word. God never gives a word that he goes back upon. And Elizabeth just holds this wonderful news to herself. She recognizes the gift that the Lord has given her and has joy. You can hear it in verse 25 when she says, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. You see, Elizabeth knows how it was viewed when a woman was barren, that it was viewed as a reproach of the Lord, that it was viewed as a negative thing, and that children are a blessing of the Lord. And so I'm sure that she had longed for a child, had hoped for a child. 
and had even probably come to grips with the fact that that was not the Lord's plan for her. And yet, they were still faithful and righteous to follow the Lord's path. God provides for Zechariah and Elizabeth, replacing their barrenness with the gift of a son. And not only a son, but one who is going to be used to prepare the way for the Messiah of Israel to come. Well, let's jump ahead and look at the conclusion to this story in verse 57 of chapter 1. Verse 57 of chapter 1 says, Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. The text shows us the fulfillment of God's promise. That God is faithful, not just in that they conceive a child, but that they give birth to a child. God always is faithful to his word. And this fulfillment of God's word leads to a recognition of God's mercy, a rejoicing from the people who are there. Both the birth and the rejoicing of the people were foretold by Gabriel and have come to fruition. That the people would gather around them and rejoice at the good news that they have a son that Gabriel's words have come true. And the proper time comes for them to name the child, and the normal tradition would be to give him the father's name. But Elizabeth speaks out, declaring that that's not what they're going to do, that they're going to name him John. And in this act, what I see when I read this and I look at Elizabeth is obedience. Obedience not to the tradition of the culture around them, but obedience to God and his command to them that they are to name him John. And that the word of the Lord and his instructions are more important than the tradition of the day. And those present question her decision. They think that perhaps she's got it wrong. And so they turn to Zechariah, wanting him to correct his wife. And yet he confirms what she has declared. He also obeys the Lord and writes out that his name is to be John. And in obedience to the words that the angel declared, Zechariah here, in his trust of God, And his obedience to God's word now finds his mouth is open and he's able to speak again. And he responds to being given his voice back by blessing God. It tells us right there in the text that he blesses God. The result that we see of Zechariah and Elizabeth's faithfulness to God was that the word spread about what God did in their lives, about the son that they have given birth to. Their faithfulness to God has led to a great blessing. I'm sure it came in the form that they never could have imagined at this point in their life. Their faith and trust, though, in God led many lives to be impacted, both in their faithfulness and in the life of their son, John. We can find great joy this season, knowing that the Lord sees us, that he knows us and knows what's going on in our hearts, and that he is faithful to his word that he has given us. The question becomes, how do we live in response to this text this morning, to the lives of Zechariah and Elizabeth and their joy found in God's faithfulness? I think the first way that we put this into practice is by walking in the commands of the Lord. What a great example both Zechariah and Elizabeth are to walk in the commands of the Lord. No matter what was happening in their life, no matter what disappointments or hardships they faced, they knew that that was of the utmost importance. I read this week Uh, uh, something written by Roland Bingham, who is a founder of a mission organization. And he wrote that it was the impassioned pleading of a quiet little Scottish lady that linked my life with the Sudan. He said, in the quietness of her parlor, she told how God had called her daughter to China and her eldest boy, Walter Gowans, to the Sudan. She spread out before me the vast extent of those thousands of miles and filled in the teeming masses of people He says, ere I closed the interview and she had placed upon me the burdens of Sudan. A year and a half later, Bingham returned to Canada alone. Walter 
and Thomas Kent had laid buried in Nigeria's interior. So he goes and he visits Mrs. Gowans to take her a few of the personal belongings of her son who had died on the mission field in Sudan. She met me there with an extended hand, and we stood in silence, he writes. And then she said these words, Well, Mr. Bingham, I would rather have had Walter go out to the Sudan and die there all alone than have him home today disobeying the Lord. Our success in this venture means nothing less than the opening of the country for the gospel, and our failure at most nothing more than the death of two or three deluded fanatics. Still, even death is not a failure, he writes. His purposes are accomplished, and he uses deaths as well as lives in the furtherance of his cause. You see, the mother of Walter Gowans knew the importance of walking in the commands of the Lord and being obedient when the Lord calls us to follow him. As those who follow Jesus Christ, our first priority is to follow him, to be obedient to his word and to his leadings. And we can practically seek to do this by ensuring that we know his word, by spending time studying the scriptures and knowing the commands of the Lord so that we can obediently obey them. Zechariah and Elizabeth modeled this by living lives of obedience to the Lord, even though they hadn't received what they had desired. Even though she was barren, they continued in the path of righteousness. You see, our obedience to the Lord is not dependent upon our satisfaction. Rather, it is an outpouring of our allegiance and worship to the Lord as our Savior. Which, when we practice this obedience and walking in the commands of the Lord, it then can lead us to cultivate hope and joy, even in the waiting seasons. I have a friend who pastors up in Junction City, and he put up a video on Facebook, and I'll post the video to our Facebook later, but it was too long for me to play this morning because it was about 13 minutes. Uh, But his name is Jason Hag, and he has a son who, Jack, he's a nonverbal autistic son, and he wrote a book a few years back called Aching Joy that talks about his journey with a nonverbal autistic son. And throughout their journey, they have had a hope, a hope for their son Jack, a hope that one day they would be able to understand what it was that he's thinking, what it was that's going on in his mind. And so they've practiced not only continuing in hope despite the hardships, but also continuing to have joy, joy in the midst of struggles, joy in the midst of their trials that they faced. And God has answered their prayers. And they've seen that this season of waiting is over as they've come across a new way that their son is actually able to communicate through spelling out his words. And the video goes through to show some of what they've been able to learn from their son. Simple things like, my glasses pinch on the right side of my head. Can you help fix that? Or preferences for food. We're talking about how difficult it is to be in this body that doesn't want to work for him, and yet he's going to choose happiness. This is a 17, 18-year-old boy. And as the family has journeyed on this journey, they've continued to have hope. They've continued to seek to have joy even in the midst of the waiting. Zechariah and Elizabeth both found themselves in that waiting season too, waiting and hoping for a child. And after even they received the news that God was going to give them a child, there still was to be more waiting more time to hope that it would be fulfilled. And Zechariah's silence represents a waiting period before the fulfillment of God's promise. So what do we do with those seasons of waiting? How do we cultivate hope and joy during those waiting seasons? I would encourage us to use those times of waiting, those times of silence to reflect, to cultivate spiritual growth, to continue to seek the Lord and to fix our eyes upon the Lord. And to practice joy in our lives, no matter what circumstances we are going through. You see, joy is not the same as happiness. Joy is a choice that we have to live lives with joy, even in the midst of hardships and trials. And lastly, I think that the text and the lives of Zechariah and Elizabeth encourage us to bless the Lord. Zechariah, as he gets his voice back, one of the first things he does is bless the Lord. And so as we seek to bless the Lord, this comes about in the form of worshiping him. As we worship God, we're giving back to him out of all that he has given us. We're seeking to bless him who has blessed us so much. 
I read one time that worshiping God is sometimes like a young child who asks his father for $10 so that he can go buy his dad a present with the $10 for his birthday. And then he gives to his father the gift that his father gave him the money to buy. And sometimes our worship is like that as well, that we've been given this great gift from God and we go to God and we ask him for forgiveness of our sins, for the grace that Jesus offers us. And we receive it and then we in turn go back to him with that and worship him. How important it is for us to return to the Lord, the source of all that we have in life and to praise him. Just look at how the psalmist declares it in 103, Psalm 103, verse 1 through 5. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, and who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. You see, God is the object of our worship. And true worship comes from a heart that is full of God, satisfied in God, fueled by our gratitude for all that he has done in our lives. So seek to find ways this week, this Advent season, to bless the Lord daily, to lift up praises to him for all that he has done in your life, and to live a life of joyful gratitude to the Lord. What a wonderful example Zechariah and Elizabeth have been of righteousness and faithfulness, perseverance in the face of a life that went away that perhaps they didn't expect. And yet seeing God still move in their midst and seeing God bless them for their pursuit of him. So this week, as we move closer to the celebration of Jesus' birth, may we slow down and recognize what it is that we are celebrating. And may we respond to the gifts that we have been given by God, the fulfillment of God's promise in Jesus Christ. May we respond with great joy and gratitude leading us to worship Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this community of believers that can come together and encourage one another in our pursuit of you. Lord, we thank you for your word today, for the example of believers throughout the ages who have shown what it means to walk righteously, seeking after you. Lord, may you help us to continue to follow after you no matter what comes our way. May we lay it before you at the foot of the cross, knowing that you are God, that you are our Lord and Savior, and that you are the one that our allegiance belongs to. Lord, give us the courage to walk these paths even when they're difficult, and even when we don't know the answers as to why we are dealing with these things. Lord, may we trust you, our Heavenly Father, and may we look to you to sustain us throughout this life. We praise you and we worship you this morning, our one and only Savior, Jesus. We pray this in your name, amen.